Hi folks, I'm going to do a quick video today to discuss a timeline that I've been asked to do for one of my college classes. Uh, I'm going to do a timeline about the history of home computers. Uh, it ties into the history of home video games, it turns out. Uh, had it not been for video games, quite frankly, the home computer market would have never taken off the way that it did back when it was really important for it to have taken off. Uh, so, a little bit of prehistory for that. The first actual video game was in 1962. It was called Space War. Uh, it was about two spaceships shooting it out while circling around a star in the middle of the screen that had a uh, gravity well pulling at them. And essentially, uh, the controls for the video game were sort of the basis for a game called Asteroids 20 years later. Um, but that started an interest in homebrew computers. Uh, that's where uh, Steve Wozniak uh, began with building his homebrew PCs and uh, that's how he and Steve got Jobs got together essentially in the early 1970s. Um, by 1972 a popular video game hit uh, being put alongside the pinball machines of the day called Pong. This was created by Atari. Uh, the fellow behind that was named Nolan Bushnell. Nolan Bushnell is one of the founding fathers of video games. He's the guy responsible for the big kick in the pants that everybody got for home video games when he came out a few years later with something called the Atari 2600. That is significant because the Atari 2600 got people used to buying video games individually to play on their uh, systems at home. Now, this ties into where the computer business starts. By 1982, a fellow by the name of Jack Trammell had started producing a computer called the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 is historically the largest selling home PC ever. I mean, it's the world record holder. It sold something like 300 million units over the course of its history. It was uh, cheap, but it was able to play graphics and things superior to the Atari 2600, actually. Uh, one of the great things about the Commodore 64 was that it was about half the price of the competing uh, computer of the time, which was the Apple II. The Apple II was about $1,200, and when it initially came out, the Commodore 64 was only $600. Within a year, the Commodore 64 dropped price to $200. So, you know, at a fraction of the cost of Apple PCs, people could have a computer in their homes and uh, kids clued into the fact that it was mostly for video games quite early. The uh, control sockets on the side actually used the same exact game controllers as the Atari 2600. Not to mention that game cartridges for the Atari 2600, you know, you had to buy individually. But software for the Commodore 64, the games, could actually be copied. There were actually softwares being put out uh, such as Dissector and uh, Super Snapshot that allowed people to make copies of store-bought video games. This was way before the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So kids wanted computers because their friends had these same computers, these Commodores, and they could get games from their friends and share and trade at their Commodore clubs. And so piracy was rampant it fueled the sales of this really inexpensive computer and everybody had a Commodore 64. This went on throughout the 80s. The Commodore 64 lasted well into the very late 80s before it was ever superseded. Now, right in the middle of the 80s though, Apple came out with a visual operating system for its book, uh, computers called Macintosh. Now the Macintosh was a one-piece PC uh, it was primarily for business. Uh, it had a piece of software called VisiCalc, which got people really interested in using it for business. And 
Apple had already successfully gotten a lot of Apple IIs into school systems by giving schools discounts. So this helped also fuel kids' interest and also teach people how to use computers, this new generation, so that by the time Windows came out in 1984, for uh, you know what we called IBM compatibles back in the time, this was significant in getting a lot of more familiarity you know, a visual medium like the uh, Mac OS or your Windows made computers a lot easier to use for people and a lot more user friendly. They didn't have to learn, you know, DOS based commands or text commands or have to learn how to program, anything of that nature. So you have this plethora of games, you have these visual operating systems, and this makes computers really start to take off. Then you proceed forward, you hit 1992 and suddenly the internet becomes commercially available to the you know home user. People were able to get online and chat on web pages and uh, you know we had something called IRC, Internet Relay Chat. Uh, there's still to this day news servers under the NNTP format where you can download music, uh, videos, you name it. There was a, there was a whole ecosystem in the internet back in the early days that really appealed to the computer nerds and uh, you know America Online jumped in and made it candy coated and easy to use for everyone with their dial up service and that again increased the interest in computers uh, 95 comes around 1995 Windows 95 comes out it's not based on DOS anymore it's actually uh, launching right into a visual operating system and it's a lot easier to use than Windows 3.1 was. Uh, this attracts more people into the IBM world, the PC compatible world. Uh, these computers are modular. You basically can open them up if the sound card's bad, pull out the sound card, pop another sound card in and on you go. You can fix them, you can work on them yourself, which is not what you could do with the Commodores, which is not what you could do with a lot of the other systems. So this helped give Windows PCs a leg up on everything else. Actually Apple uh, was struggling in the 90s until in the late 90s they came out with the iMac which sounds like iPod and iPhone. That's because it was basically it was a visual appeal thing. They had these pastel colored one piece units. They had a number of design characteristics that were you know friendly and cute and everybody liked the visual appeal of the unit itself and of course it was a visual operating system so they could still use it for things but Windows you know dominated for a very long time and you know to this day you've got your hardcore Mac fans but primarily Windows continues to uh, have a great market share let's say. Commodore had long since gone bankrupt uh, back in like 92 I believe it was but this continues to go to this day. Probably the the last major f change was the uh, micro miniaturization, of course, where computer chips keep getting smaller, processors keep getting faster and stronger. I mean, today's cell phones have quad core processors. You didn't have quad core processors in PCs until around 2007, 2008. Uh, so, you know, the hardware development, you know, Moore's Law is continuing to this day to make things better, faster, stronger, and of course the internet becoming faster. So it just spirals from there to continue to get, you know, bigger and better to this day to the point now where you're carrying a computer in your pocket, whether you realize it or not, every time you use your smartphone, you're internet connected, you have a, a video camera in your pocket at all times, yeah, and now it's getting into wearables you know, smart watches, uh, your uh, Google Glass glasses. So that's where it's going to head next, I think. But, th but all of this began, you know, from a video game perspective. And thankfully it did, or wouldn't be where we are today. And that's my uh, timeline. So hope you enjoyed it. Hope I didn't take up too much of your time. And I hope you find it a little bit enlightening. Maybe you learned something. So y'all... Keep them steady out there and have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one. Bye.